Welcome to True Power, home of the most powerful marketing tools, training, and technology on planet Earth. Get ready to earn, enjoy, and experience more than you ever dreamed was possible. If you're tired of just getting by and ready to really thrive, then buckle in and listen up. Here's your host, Matt Fox. Hello and welcome to True Power Academy. Today we have an exciting and informative session lined up for you. I am thrilled to introduce our presenters today, both John McDonald and Everett Brewer from Wathub. In this week's session, we are going to be diving into session 301, which is the outline and overview uh, of financing types, understanding which financing works for which type of customers, uh, credit underwriting, and fundable contracts. And whether you're a seasoned professional or just getting started, this session is packed with valuable information to help you navigate the complexities of financing in the commercial solar sector. So let's get started with John McDonald and Everett Brewer of WattHub. Gentlemen, take it away. For those of you who have not seen the 101 and 201, John McDonald, Everett Brewer are your presenters. Say hello, Everett. Good, good morning, everyone. Thank you. So we went through this on the 101 and 201s. We figured we'd have a little fun with these slides. Prior to solar, I trained big cats and I had a mullet. Uh, they called me the king. Uh, then I got into solar and once uh, I saw a solar panel under producing, I gave it a stern look and it shaped back up. And I'm in the process of patenting the renewable human hamster wheel that everyone will have in their house and they will jog and produce energy. Everett Brewer once built a battery system uh, for a utility scale solar system out of AAA Duracell batteries. Uh, he yelled at a building management system once and it smartened up. And when he does push ups, it actually pushes the world down. So these are false claims, everybody. So you'll have to really, if you want to find out about who we are and, and who Wadhub is, view the 101 and 201 trainings that are on YouTube. Now, obviously, everybody wants to know who the heck is Wathub. So, uh, Wathub is a business that uh, we've been in business for over 13 years now. Um, we have proudly processed and supported over a billion dollars of projects, uh, is what we just hit this year. Um, in uh, requisition week two, is we support over 3,800 channel partners nationwide um, in the commercial solar industry. So, industrial. Uh, renewables, of course, and uh, utility scale projects. So feel free to reach out to us. We've done multiple get, uh, government and agency solutions. Uh, we submitted for multiple RFPs and RFQs. Uh, we support, uh, support all different underwriting types, which we're going to be really focusing on today and nonprofit grants, CNI, tax equity. And we also have a plethora of options, uh, submissions for energy efficiency, building management systems, and energy storage. So we're proud owners of, of WattHub. We also own Stores Power, which is on the energy storage side, is in, and along with Lockbit, which is uh, strictly going to be in the automation and building controls position. So over 25 years combined experience in constructing uh, many installs across America, we're happy to you know get diving into the energy uh, financing portion of this, this training today. All right. What we learned from Commercial Solar Training 201, we, we talked a lot about pricing examples, rooftop carport, superstructure, all of that. Constructability, we want to design with simple in mind because the more complicated it gets, the more expensive it gets, the less of chance it's going to pencil. Uh, installation schedule, the samples, we went through our process and why we go through our process and there's a lot of steps is to make sure that everybody's on the same page, everyone has sign off, we don't skip a step and then run into a hiccup later. Setting proper expectations with customers, really showing them that you understand the commercial solar process from sale to contract all the way through to installation and commissioning. And then we talked about examples of transformer, no transformer. Do we add one and use 480 inverters and we connect to a 208 service or do we not use one and use 208 inverters? It's just a pricing exercise. 
Uh, if you want to see that, go to youtube.com backslash Wathub. We're going to jump right into it. We've got a lot to cover, like I said before. Uh, the 301 course outline is the more advanced. Um, we're going to keep it high level. We could dive so far into this that you'll never turn back. So financing types is the first one we're going to go through. There's a lot of them, and there's combinations of them, which we will talk about. Understanding which financing works for which customer. This is the biggest challenge in commercial solar is you get a customer, do they have tax appetite, do they not have tax appetite, are they for profit, are they nonprofit? There's a spider's web there which you want to follow in order to get the best probability of success uh, funding a deal. Funding a deal means it gets installed, installation means you make commission. Uh, credit underwriting, this is huge. We have a subscription to Moody's uh, Risk Calc, which is uh, a Moody's product. We're going to talk a little bit about that. It's a software program. It does the underwriting for us and spits off a credit rating. But without that, we'll teach you the high-level ways of looking at financials and a balance sheet and seeing if your customer is credit worthy or don't spend any time on it. Uh, what makes a fundable contract? Now, there's multiple contracts. First contract is the contract with the customer for financing, whether it's a loan, a lease, a uh, PPA. We're going to talk about that contract. Then there's a contract with the developer or the EPC or both, if you are a developer EPC. Talk about the nuances of that. And then other contracts and additional documentation that you need to familiarize yourself with, you're going you're gonna to hear about. You may not be handling, but you'll understand that these things are needed. That all falls back to setting proper expectations and knowing what documentation is needed to solidify a deal A to Z. And then Everett will talk about sales confidence. So jumping right into it, PPA, SSA, Power Purchase Agreement, Solar Service Agreement. You're most likely all familiar with this terminology. Uh, there's people also call energy service agreement. I've seen that, and typically that includes energy efficiency, whether it be uh, storage or lighting or HVAC. Uh, same same thing as we learned from 101 and 201. The cost dictates the rate, and so the more expensive the project, the higher the PPA rate is. There's some concessions going on right now that certain financing companies, including us, are offering either a 50% year one discount and, and or a year discount. Well, those do need to be paid for. So uh, it's spread throughout the remaining PPAs. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. When looking at a commercial solar project, whether it be nonprofit or for-profit, uh, certain states allow for PPAs for for-profit entities like California. Certain states do not, like where I am, Arizona um, and Utah. Utah has some weird state language that says if it's a third party owned, you need to pay tax on, on that. And ever can elaborate on that, but you're gonna wanna stick with your open source PPA documents, your solar service agreements. And what open source means is, for example, the Solar Energy Industries Association, the large parent company that oversees, they have a PPA, they have an SSA, they have a lease. They're, it's open source documents because they put the money and the, and the legal time and, and effort into creating one that everybody can use. Not everybody uses it. Some people use a version of it. So when you're getting financial bids, one company may have a different version, but they all generally speaking say the same thing. There's instances, for example, that we got a PPA sign that someone said, hey, I need your help on financing. So we said, okay, we can, we can look at it. The PPA in total was, I think, six or seven pages. And it was boiled down and whittled down where it had some of the necessary sections in it, but somebody went and deleted it to make it more reader-friendly, customer-friendly. But that hurt it because when we went to finance that it was an unfundable contract. So they didn't use an open source, they used their own, they deleted sections, and it was it's just a nightmare, it makes it unfundable. So now we're in the process of getting that PPA amended by the customer, and nothing's worse than getting a deal signed, thinking you got a deal in the bag, and then having to go back to them and say, just kidding, 
let's uh, we need certain sections in there. We can help with that too. So we have open source documents that everybody uses. Uh, the lion's share of financing companies out there. I think some of them are on this call today, so we appreciate your time. And we can help you navigate the waters of making sure that your contract that your customer signs is a fundable agreement. Getting into an operating lease. So this is a lease for a company, typically for profit, that does not have the tax appetite. So it's also known as a true lease where the leasing company takes the tax benefit. So it's similar to a PPA, but for for-profit. Uh, operating leases, generally speaking, are not available to nonprofits. There are some creative attorneys out there that would object to that statement and say, we've done it, which I understand the method that they're going to have to kind of make the lease walk, talk, and act like a PPA, but it's not. And so if you run and get a operating lease signed with a nonprofit entity, it's likely unfundable. The typical structure of an operating lease is it's a lease that funds 100% of the solar project. There's a payment associated with it. They can go 7, 10, 15. I've seen them out to 20 years. They have a buyout at the end. So that's how it, it differs from a PPA is there's a set buyout rate. It's usually 15 or 20% at the end of 12 or 15 years uh, or, or seven years, depending on who's funding that. Uh, it is not fair market value. It's just that that buyout is set. And these are good. We, we've done a lot of these operating leases when the grant, uh, grant in lieu of the tax credit was available. So back in 2010, 11, 12, we did a lot of operating leases because there was no ITC. There was a grant in lieu. So that those worked. Um, so generally speaking, you're going to want to make sure that you're looking at for-profit customers that don't have a tax appetite. Maybe they're real estate investors that own a bunch of properties and they just want to finance it, but they have so much depreciation from their properties that they have no tax appetite. So that could be available. Absolutely. And on another, another comment in that regards to the operating leases, um, you know, one main identifier is, is that if they've got confirmed you know, if you can have just a real world conversation with them is, is that, you know, can you give me a little context behind on why you don't have that, that tax appetite? And if it's, you know, a farming and agency or, you know, commercial real estate or something like that, sometimes they've got so much depreciation as John referenced built up that, that uh, it makes sense. They don't have the appetite to monetize those tax credits and incentives, but if they kind of have any other position or response to that, that typically means is if they're not paying taxes, that typically means they're not profitable. And if they're not profitable, that means they have a high probability of having poor show showing bad or, or low financial stability of their business, which makes it extremely difficult to underwrite or finance in general. So definitely look at those, those questions and those positions. Um, don't be afraid to ask those questions. Full financial transparency is what's key. The more the customer is willing to disclose in that regard means that they're, they're are going to be more open to having those discussions and be more of a committed customer considering, you know, these questions are very, uh, uh surface in this position or this timeline where there's going to be a lot more questions that are come along the line. So definitely open them up for those positions, um, in that regard and just be aware that, you're going to put a lot of time and investment of time to get this product to the finish line. And if that identifier is that their financials are might be poor in that regard to where an operating lease may be the solution, it may be tough to get that project across the finish line in that regard. Yep. And one other thing is when you're talking to a customer, a for-profit entity, collateral is a known subject to them. They buy and sell real estate, their business, uh, they have to put up a personal guarantee for an operating lease. It's no questions asked. It is what it is. There's some investors that own properties that will be fine with that. They're like yeah, personal guarantee, no problem. Some investors are non-recourse. They don't want any collateral whatsoever. They don't want their buildings collateral. They don't want a personal guarantee. They just want someone to give them the loan. Another red flag is someone who says, I won't personally guarantee a lease or a loan. You may want to take a look at why that is. So jumping in, a capital lease. So different than an operating lease in the fact that 
it's basically a loan with a dollar buyout. If the one takeaway you get from this is operating lease, the tax benefits go to the leasing company. Capital lease, the tax benefits go to the customer. So this is essentially a loan with a dollar buyout. It's called a lease. A typical terms are less than 12 years. We haven't got quoted anything that was greater than that. Um, if, you, if you need greater than that, uh, a term to pencil the project, you're going to be looking at a loan. But seven years is average. You can associate a capital lease with a general equipment lease. Like if you're buying a phone system or a truck or anything for your business, a lot of customers do do capital leases on those things. It allows them to write off the, tax, the lease payments and take that as tax deductions. So this is appropriate for for-profit or non-profit customers that just want some short-term, you know, seven-year financing, maybe 10 years. And generally speaking, you're going to need a project that's above a quarter million dollars to have anybody come to the table that wants to fund it. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about minimum thresholds as we go through these financing project products. And 250 to 350, just keep that, write that down, keep that in your mind as I want a project bigger than that, or else it, there's going to be a really tough time to fund it. Getting into loans, it's a loan, loans alone. We all work in loans. Uh, with commercial, there's no loan pal, there's no service finance, there's no mosaic, there's an, there's nobody that is cookie cutter, turnkey, here's your credit score, here's a loan, unfortunately. Uh, loans for, are for commercial solar above 350000 and third-party lenders we can bring to the table. So we know a lot of them. Third-party lenders could be SBA, it could be regional banks, could be Green Bank, could be hundreds of, of different people. Nobody wants to write loans under 350000 in our experience. So what's left is going to the customer's bank. Uh, that's the number one thing that we talk to when we talk to a customer and set expectations. Let's check with your bank first because you have the relationship. Banks are relationship-based. They want to lend to people that they serve the account and have money go in and out. Loans or interest rates are going to range anywhere between six and eight. Lo interest rates are down now, so they may be in the five. Uh, you, if it's a real estate loan with real estate as collateral, let's say it's a owner operator business, owns the building, runs the business, they can go to their bank and probably get a 4.5% loan right now for solar, assuming the bank is solar friendly. That's the first place I would check if, you, if you're talking loans with your customer. Anything outside of that, you know, 350,000 SBA goes 20 or 25 years. Uh, USDA has a loan guarantee program that's great. You may be in the low sixes for interest rate. The longer the term of loan you go, the more your interest rate affects the payment. So example would be, I'm getting a mortgage. I get a 30 year loan and I've got a 3.5% interest rate. If you jump to four, your payment varies wildly. If you got a car loan for five years and you had a 3.5% interest and then it jumped to 4% interest, your payment barely budges. So when you think about loans, the longer term affects the, the interest rate affects it substantially. And unfortunately, it's a game that banks play is hey, if you want your money long term, you want my money long term, you're going to pay a little bit more in interest. You want a short term, I'll give you a break. And that's where we run several different financial scenarios, trying to come up with what is the best for our customers. Absolutely. And kind of add to that too, is when it comes down to the term, keep in mind is you're going to hear different things from financial institutions where you talk about term or amortization. What happens is, is that you might have a 25 year AM, but it'll only be a 10, seven year term. So at the end of that seven year term, uh, you're forced to either refinance or pay a balloon in that regard. Many financial institutions will allow you to refinance at that position, but allows them to readjust the rate at that year, five, seven, 10, whichever negotiated up front. So definitely looking for that, for those positions in that regard. Um, when you hear the difference between, hey, the term seven years, but the AM is 25. So you're getting a payment over a 25 year amortization. You're only gonna buy down XYZ worth of payments during that seven year term, which means there'll be a substantial balance still due. 
it's not going to look as attractive for the fact is like, wait a minute, my original loan was $400,000. Why did over seven years, I only bought down 46,000. Um, it's because of course you have a larger balance. So the interest securing on the total balance in that position. Good point. And those, those term loans, the seven year term, 25 year amortization, they're fantastic. If, if we can get them for customers, all day long these customers for for profit they're all used to refinancing their building in five or ten years so a seven or ten year uh, balloon payment isn't a bad thing they just they're going to refinance it and a couple years from now everybody's going to be offering refinances for loans uh, on commercial assuming that the balance is you know meets their minimum threshold everett you want to jump on c pace a lot yeah, of people are waiting for, for this. Yeah, so um, across the United States, there's actually 66 PACE companies that go through. So PACE is a property assessed financing, property assessed tax financing. Um, what it goes off of is off the, the, the balance sheet. It's off the balance sheet financing, which is great. So in this scenario, they're not going to have that debt reference to their balance sheet, which tied up any kind of uh, loan capacity for them in the future. The effective rate that I do want to reference here is a little bit different, okay? So even though you might see a PACE financier that references a 6.5% um, interest rate on the rate, might be uh, seven and a quarter is a common one in California. Um, what happens is because you're only paying that, that balance down in association with the interest, once every six months or biannually in some markets like utah for example you actually pay your property taxes annually what happens is is that you're incurring more interest on the total balance think of it kind of like a car loan a car loan you are purchasing every single you're making a payment every single month so you're actually applying down the interest um, that occurred on that total uh principal balance in that regard so you're continually continually breaking that down but as time goes by, that interest is still occurring. So you're actually paying interest on top of interest. So to come up with a, uh, an actual effective rate, you'll see that if Watthub ever runs any calculations for you, um, to hit the payment in the cash flow, we'll typically grab like a 9.12% interest rate for California on a 25 year pace that uh, where the original interest rate was sitting at seven and a quarter. Okay, so just in that position. Now you do have that option to where you can buy down the rate, which means is if you're looking to uh, own that loan for more of a longer term through the life of the loan for that 20, 25, 30 year loan uh, position, then buying down the rate might be a good deal. They usually allow you to buy down two points. So there'll be a certain dollar amount that's uh, required up front, and then you can buy from seven and a quarter to six and a quarter, and then down to five and a quarter. But keep in mind that five and a quarter is definitely more attractive for the long-term haul. But unfortunately, to get to the effective rate, uh, to get that true APR, um, that five and a quarter loan on a 25-year term, I'm now having to put in a 6.78% interest rate inside of the tool to kick out the proper payment term. So just keep that in mind. To, for approval for these PACE loans, they look at your property, uh, uh, property tax base and your property assessed value. So um, there are going to be some underwriting fees that are gonna do up front. Um, the most common underwriting fee that's due up front, whether you get approved or not, is for an appraisal. Those appraisals, the client needs to make sure they're aware of an investment anywhere from $1,500 to $2,500 will be due to start that appraisal process. Um, a lot of times that client may have had appraisal in the last 12 to 24 months, most times the PACE providers will not accept that uh, proposal. They'll want to run an independent um, appraisal on their own. So that's what they'll look at from an underwriting standpoint. The loan to values in different markets, like I said, there's 66 providers underneath PACE Nation, if you want to look that up online. And you'll see different programs that have different filters and different minimum uh, thresholds for costs of total project being able to finance. But amongst that, you'll see different aspects of, hey, do you know what my loan to value right now, my building's 50% uh, and in California and XYZ County, they will go up to a 90% loan to value. So those are some of the things that have um, the ability to come through there. 
So in the, the one of the questions that came down, how does having the project installed affect the future tax assessment? The convenience with renewable energy is that is it, if it's uh, independently owned in that regard, most markets will not put that solar against the property assessed value. It'll go against the total uh, value of the project and that's how you pay down your payment. Um, the reason that PACE can go out to a longer term is simply this, small business especially is high risk for default. And because the loan is attached to the property taxes, in the case that business defaults, they have something still attached to the property tax that'll then go to the new owner. So there's less liability in the default in that position where it's not attached to the actual business entity and how they operate their business or the individual. It'll always stay assessed with the property. The underwriting times do take longer. So I do want to actually have that you do have these, the, the additional patients in this position. Uh, two to four months is typical. Um, we've seen as long as six to seven months in some areas. So please be more patient with a pace underwriting type. Uh, and there's a lot of moving parts that go on the back end there. It's not always on our side. The proper agreements are always submitted in a timely manner in the case that we are supporting those financing solutions. But know that they have to go submit for those bonds, go do financial reviews and additional underwriting costs on their side. Another unique position is, is that there's an option for a PACE PPA. Um, this is a position to where if it is a for-profit or non-profit in this regard, you have the ability to, uh, in essence, do a PPA type financing. And there's the convenience with the P PACE PPA. If the property assessed value is already at 80 or 90% loan to value, okay, meaning is the ability to uh, support that, that equity in the property is lacking, what then happens is, is that a PACE PPA, they do a new assessment each year for only the payments that are due during that 12 months. So it does open up more lending in, in, in all reality. Um, to do a bigger size project to where the total project cost is not put on the PACE value. It's just based off of the 12 months payments. So there is some workarounds in the case that they don't have the equity available. So in some projects that don't qualify for CPACE, a PACE PPA could potentially qualify, but how the, the, the guts of a PACE PPA is essentially they fund the, the full project 100% plus their fees with PACE and that equals the payment and then they pass that along. So there, there's ways that, you know, they put this and they, they net present value all of the O&M all into the one PACE loan, but the way they assess it uh, opens up that availability to do bigger projects in, in a PACE. Absolutely. Another, another benefit in this position is if a client has less than attractive uh, financials in any way, shape, or form. As long as they're paying their property taxes, they haven't filed for bankruptcy in the last five years, then PACE could be a great option for them for a long-term loan in those regard. And some markets in Cal like California, you can go all the way down to a $33,000 loan um, in that scenario. Now, keep in mind, there are some limitations to where certain counties and jurisdictions do not have pay net PACE financing available. Um, right in your backyard, you actually may not even know that there's gaps in some of those markets. Most common PACE markets that are available that where the loans are more attractive is markets like Florida and California where cost of energy is a little higher. But keep in mind, we'll, we'll reference that in the case you need our support, and we can look at other financing options, including PACE and other prospective markets. All right. Prepaid PPAs or prepaid solar service agreements, which, whichever state you're in, uh, prepaid is a great tool, and uh, you guys all probably know Collective Sun. Uh, there's other companies out there that do residential prepaids, uh, so get with us on the on the back end if you need that. Uh, so prepaid PPA, it's a discount on the project through a third-party tax equity company. We do a lot of these in-house um, to a certain upper threshold where we have a handful of private investors that love these we love them we buy them because they're great uh, tax shelters so how this works we're going to talk a little bit about that but we're going to keep it high level so it similar to a ppa or, or a solar service agreement ssa 
there's a long-term agreement with the customer. The difference in this prepaid contract, when we get into fundability of contracts, there is a trigger. So the trigger is at year six or seven, whichever one you set it at. So it's third party owned for that period of time. And then the owner can elect to turn the project over and how that trigger works is there's a fair market value that equals uh, a fair market value equals the principal balance of the loan trigger happens. That's all you need to know is it, there's a turnover and a trigger to satisfy the IRS requirements. So when you're looking at a prepaid PPA agreement, it's going to look a lot like a traditional PPA, only they're going to have certain clauses in there that allows for that trigger and there's predetermined values that nobody can really uh, argue against because uh, we reverse engineer them to be an actual fair market value in year six. So today, an investor contributes 13% of the project and the customer pays 87%. Next year, that changes because com commercial solar drops down to 22%. So again, it's it generally speaking, it's about 50% of the tax credit. So 26%, cut it in half. That's what the investor is going to contribute. They get no benefit from the depreciation because the prepayment from the customer is uh, the law changed when Trump changed the depreciation taxes that change the income of the prepayment. So the prepayment, the investor has to show his income, which, you know, whether it was spent to build the project or not, it doesn't matter. It's income. Depreciation counteracts against the income. So that's really a wash, generally speaking. Next year, it's going to be 22%. You're going to see 11% prepaid in the commercial space. And so this can be coupled with other financing, if they want to get a loan for the 87%, if they want to run PACE for the 87%, if they want to pull cash out of their mattress, wonderful. But prepaids really have a stronghold for nonprofits that want to own the system. And so how we sell this is we go to the customer, typically a church or a school, and they say, all right, well, we, we can get the cash or we have the cash to buy it, but we want a value for the tax credits. We can come in and say, all right, we can provide a prepaid where we invest 13%. So you're only paying 87% versus 100%, and we maintain it for the time that we own it. So that's another big benefit as we make sure it's operating properly, it's maintained, anything that happens, if a fuse blows or needs servicing or panel cleaning, all paid for from the third party. That's part of the 50% discount they get on the tax credit. And it is a, actually a wonderful investment if you make a lot of money and need a, sh a tax shelter. Absolutely. An additional comment there is, is that, you know, please keep in mind, you know, the comment of that these are for nonprofit businesses. I will tell you from the experience that we have here at Wadhub, you know, we see over 150 projects on average a month here. And many of them are nonprofit to where, hey, I've got a project and they're just needing financing. We then identify that it's a uh, nonprofit entity and they're looking for 100% financing. So I'd probably say five out of 10 nonprofits where they're looking for 100% financing does not know about the PPA, SSA, and prepaid PPAs or prepaid PPAs with PACE or PACE PPAs. These are all great options for nonprofit entities to where doing just a straight purchase as a nonprofit is doing them a disservice and also hurting their model. And it's taking a very poor approach in that regard. So please reference us in the case you run to those nonprofits. We need to do our, our best and be good stewards of our businesses to give them the best return as possible. There's money available. Please take advantage of it. And for about a couple of dozen companies out there that, you know, subscribe and they're, and they're really close, we, we'll do, the, the sales for you if you want to uh, on the project. So we'll bring the contract. We'll talk to your customer, walk them through it because we know this inside and out. We know what can be done and what can't be done when they start talking about changes to the contract to make sure that it fits the investor's criteria. So we're happy to jump in and be right alongside you. Next up, we have choosing a financing company. Let's use an example of you and you say, I've got a project and it needs a financing company, uh, it needs a PPA. I want different PPA companies to bid on different projects. Well, how 
you get these bids, how do you vet them? How do you choose them? Uh, one of the things that we look at is milestone terms. There's some companies that are awesome to work with. They have four or five milestones and they pay you when you hit that milestone. Other companies have net 30 terms and you have to get them just a slew of pictures, a slew of documentation, basically recordings of you actually physically doing the, the project. Uh, milestone requirements, there's laundry lists of requirements that could be, could be dealing with the utility company, it could be dealing with the AHJ, and all those go into an EPC contract that we're going to talk about later on what makes you know, a good fundable EPC contract. If it's a new company, if you go on their website and they're brand new and based on the 201 and 101 trainings, you're going to want to do your due diligence on a financing company as you do with an EPC that, that you're hiring to build your project. As we do, you want to know how long they've been in business. You want to know their track record. You want to ask them if their capital is discretionary. So they have a fund that they put together that they can deploy for commercial solar. Well, do they need to go and ask and beg and plead for this project to go through or are they portfolioing projects? So they need 10 projects and yours makes five. Well, they need the other five. So that's a time duration that just your project just sits there. All these are questions that you want to discuss with the financing company and make sure that this process is fast because if it's not fast and it's ungodly slow, it's going to look bad on your customer. They're going to be calling you or emailing you saying, what's going on with my project? When you're looking at a loan or a leasing company, you're going to want to look at what is collateral. So this is the big term. And anytime you're dealing with a for-profit, this is standard language. You're going to say, hey, you want a loan? Are you willing to offer personal guarantee? Are you willing to offer your building as a second uh, lien on, on the real estate so we can know where to go? If they say yes on the personal guarantee, awesome. If they say yes on the collateral, even better because they can get a better term and a better interest rate on a loan if they use their real estate as collateral, but not everybody is willing to do that. So the conversation up front when you're talking about, hey, you want to go solar, you're really excited, you can put it on the roof, you can you can put it in carports, look at all this space, let me look at your service entrance. Before you leave, you want to say, how would you like to pay for this? Simple question, but it gets missed by 80% of the salespeople because they don't want to broach that subject. They're excited about the deal. They're excited about the opportunity and the potential to make a big commission. We need to talk about this because your time is more valuable than any other commission. And if you work two years on a deal and don't get paid because this cu customer can't get financing anywhere, you're going to want to know that up front. Absolutely. And, and some of the things from a collateral aspect is, you know, making sure that you account for any type of personal collateral in that regard. So like was referenced as a PG, as, as you said, John, um, if those of you are not familiar with a, a personal guarantee, um, a lot of times the individual has to be in a part in association with those agreements. And in that position, they become the collateral. Um, anybody that's part of that entity that has a 20, a 19, 20% stake or larger inside of the corporation has to, you know, come to the table as, as an asset or collateral for those positions. So definitely just don't, don't be uh, timid to the fact of asking the right questions um, up front in the case of certain underwriting types that come into play. So now we're going to go a little deep. So the capital stack, we've all heard that. They say, oh, you know, I can bring the entire capital stack. What the heck are they talking about? Well, they're talking about the three types of money that goes into a typical project. And then after this, we're going to go even deeper. But again, keep it high level. The reason why we want to talk about this stuff is because when you hear it in the field, you'd be like, yep, I know what that is. So tax equity, that's the money that's invested for the tax benefits. And we're going to talk about how the tax equity investor reaps that in just a second. Sponsor equity, that's cash on cash. That's somebody investing in the project and getting a cash on cash return, similar to a dividend or just a, uh, an equity uh, reimbursement. And then there's debt. So a tax equity investor can buy and own the entire PPA and they put up all the money. 
that's very easy. That's the most simplistic. We love that. We've done a lot of deals funding it with private investors that just say, we say, all right, it's a $200,000 deal. You put up all the money and this is what you get. You get the tax benefits, the depreciation, the cash flow over 20 years, and then you have your expenses of O&M and reserves. But separating these things, you'll see a lot of people talk about funds. Oh, we put a fund together and it's through a partnership flip or a sale leaseback, which we're going to get into. This is how they fund the deal. They get a tax equity investor. They come up with, let's say, 50% debt. We really don't see a lot of projects that are underwritten that get more than 50% debt, maybe 55 or 60 in some instances with high PPAs or high operating lease payments. But there is a delta that is left and that's sponsor equity. So they need somebody to bring in cash to fill that gap. And it's usually around 20 to 25% of the entire project that's filled with sponsor equity. But those are the three types of money that go into a project. So when you say, when you run across a commercial solar financing company and they say, yep, we've got a fund and we do a partnership flip structure. This is a structure that essentially has the developer. So that the person that puts the whole project together, brings in the money, does everything, they need a tax equity partner to monetize the tax benefits. So they bring them in for a period of time. And that period of time is usually seven years, give or take a year. And the general partner owns 1%. The tax credit investor owns 99%. All the tax credits flow to the tax equity investor. And then the flip happens. So there's a trigger in the contract that says, all right, I'm going to buy you out with this dollars. And then all of the payments go to the developer, developer owns 99%, uh, and then long-term. This structure is good for a developer or a fund that just wants a limited tax equity guy to come in, monetize the tax benefits, get the heck out, and then the developer is going to own long-term. You've got sale leaseback structures. This was famous, uh, if you guys remember Sun Edison, this is how they structured all of their deals. This is more of a structure that has the tax equity investor and the solar developer in more of a long-term contract. So they are splitting cash flows and ride into the sunset together. There's ways that you can get the tax credit investor out after the recapture period, but this is just another way to fund a deal. So if you ever create a fund in your lifetime and you hire an attorney to do so, they're going to say, which structure do you want to raise this fund? So we're not going to spend too much time on it. And then an inverted lease structure, WTF, what the hell is going on in this graph? I don't even know. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, this is a structure that, from what I do know, Solar City did this back in the day. So they were famous for doing an inverted lease or lease pass-through, as it's called. And what this does, it allows certain state tax benefits to be separated out from the tax, the federal tax credit. So it's a, a crazy structure that uh, a, some nutty lawyers came up with, but it works and it's complicated. So, and some of those state tax credits that are being references is in most cases are a state income tax level. So you got makers depreciation at the state level, for example, and in markets like Arizona, uh, Utah has a state tax credit that has a cap on it. Uh, California has maker's tax depreciation. Um, so anything with income in that, in that perspective state allows for the, uh, another party and an excess state to pass through that partial benefit in that regard. And then everything else stays at the leasor level for the federal level tax credits and depreciation. Correct. High level stuff. This came from all these graphs actually came from Novogratic. They're a San Francisco based a tax equity and, and CPA firm that is known for putting together funds and structures. So we worked on a project that they were hired on. And, and so that's how we learned uh, from the best. We're going to talk a little bit about why own solar. So why does financing companies do this? Uh, mainly, it's a tax credit play. If you take out the tax credits and incentives from owning a PPA, for example, you're looking at maybe one and a half to four percent cash on cash return. I know I can do a heck of a lot better. 
other places, but that's not why people invest in solar. So investors want to own the assets for the tax benefits. Cash flow is sort of gravy on top of that. Uh, fixed income, there's a lot of funds out there like the, the, the next eras of the world and the, the U.S. banks and the Wells Fargo that they are just interested in fixed income. So the one and a half to four percent cash flow is good for them. But a lot of private investors needs to be a little bit more. So the different types of we talked about tax equity, we talked about sponsor equity and accredited investors and C corporations, leasing companies, real estate income automatically can take the tax incentives. No questions asked based on the IRS rules. When you get into active income, so we have a lot of investors that make a lot of money from their day job. They want to own solar projects because they need the tax credits. That is active income. You have to pass certain IRS material participation tests to make sure that they do that. So what we do is we help investors, we advise that this is how you want to do that to make sure that the IRS doesn't come sniffing and recapture that. But we are not a CPA, and I know that big fat disclaimer is coming out here, but we know because we've done it quite a bit, and we put our money where our mouth is, and we do it ourselves. So next, here's a little graph. It might be helpful to you is how does money come back to an investor? So they invest a dollar in a solar pro project. Today, they get 26 cents back from federal tax credits. If there's local incentives, SGIP, T-REX, SREX, Smart Inverters, whatever, uh, that goes back to the investor. Depreciation, after at a 28% tax bracket, you're roughly going to get 25% back by not having to pay taxes on your on your business, your active income. And then your PPA payments, you know, at a 2% escalator, generally speaking, you know, you're getting eight cents a year back and growing. So that's going to equate to $2 or $2.50 long-term over a PPA uh, or operating lease or some sort of financed project. So use this slide as, you know, if you have an investor that you want to talk a little bit about owning a solar project, these are great for small one-off solar projects that nobody else will fund. We do a lot of those deals because they're great projects, investment grade, and nobody will touch them. So your 30 kilowatt churches, your 70 kilowatt charter school, great, could make great customers, but there's not a market for that. And so another thing we do is help structure these and we put investors into solar projects to make them money. If we do that correctly, your project moves forward and it gets funded and then you get the commission developer fee, EPC, you get the work. Absolutely. And, and another, another term in that regard is, you know, why that, this, that area is very underserved is because when you look at your traditional tax equity firms that are picking up projects, you know, a lot of times we, it, what was referenced in, in training 201 and also one-on-one -on -one is that, you know, look for projects that are typically have a $2,000 utility bill or larger. Why we reference that threshold is simply because that typically puts you in about a hundred KW PV array size, which puts you in that 225,000 to $355,000 um, total project cost. Those are the projects that traditional financiers are going to get into 100 KW or larger. A lot of it comes down to is there's a lot of title work on the back end. There's a lot of admin responsibility when you're trying to operate at scale multiple assets um, of smaller size or capacity. A lot of times those firms like to blend those with bigger projects that are one, two, three, four, five megawatts as well. And so it's not that those other projects that are smaller are not financeable. A lot of times, like John had referenced, those projects are very attractive. Um, the Boys and Girls Club that's been around for 72 years, you know, your local church, your sheriff's posse, your small city county buildings, those are all secured assets, great, great financial uh, history in those regards. It's just that it doesn't meet the check boxes of those traditional uh, high level at tax equity funds. So in that regard, those projects are available and we fund them um, all the time. So keep that in mind in case you guys wanna play in that sandbox, which John will get into now. So pitch alert, doing a pitch. You ready? Here it comes. Become a solar investor. So what we found success in over the past 13 years is putting these small projects together, whether it's small portfolios or finding a tax equity investor or just a rich guy that needs tax credits. And we say, I want to teach you how to do this. 
we're going to put all the contracts together. We're going to assign the project to you because we will we'll sign the PPAs as Wahub and then assign it to the tax equity investor after uh, before construction, but after all the docs are signed. We've been successful at that, but it's always been on a one-off. So we are doing uh, something a little different. We've engaged a law firm to create a fund for us, and we're doing small projects. So we're doing the projects that no one else wants to touch, 30, 50, 70 kilowatts projects that have investment grade credit because we run the credit for you, but nobody will touch them. No one will do a one-off, even a municipality, a county that's 60 kilowatts. No, that doesn't fit into any tax equity investors box. So it goes unfunded until now. So what we're doing is we're putting together sponsor equity funds. So the first three high yield portfolio, blended large and blended portfolio, you can invest as soon. I should preface this. It's coming soon. You can invest as little as a thousand dollars into the project and we're giving anywhere between six and eight and a half, four and a half to seven, or if you want to do the blended six to seven and a half dividends, cash on cash. So we're raising sponsor equity, which we talked about. If you want to get into tax equity, we have little projects. You need to have a O or have paid in about twenty thousand dollars more in taxes to really be effective to get a sizable project to get you that uh, that tax credit. Small projects are the best yields, and we say that because small projects typically don't have demand charges. And if they're in the small or extra small rate category, whether you're in California, Arizona, or Massachusetts, they're under that demand-based threshold. And so all of their energy gets charged as kilowatt hours, which is wonderful. We've seen 18, 22, 26 cent avoided costs. So you can have a high PPA. You can have a 16, 18, 20 cent PPA. The customer saves five, six cents a kilowatt hour. It's fantastic. You get into the larger projects, the more they buy, the more they pay for energy, it just gets harder and harder to pencil. Uh, so invest in a solar fund, cash on cash. We will let you all know when this is available. It's not available today, but we're going to make it live in the next few months and put your money where your mouth is. Absolutely. And a couple quick comment about that is, is that I'd like to, to just preface the time value of money in this regard. Okay. So when I talk, when we talk about sponsor equity, what's great is, is that money can be an investment and it actually doesn't have a time requirement in association with it. Okay. So in the case you want to make that investment, you know, you get your yield or return back on your thousand dollars for that year. You're in good shape and you're, you're happy and you're off to the next investment or next uh, venture in your life. But when it comes to the tax equity side, keep in mind is that's a five year full fiscal year commit at minimum. The, fe the federal tax credit, even though you have the ability to monetize it year one, actually best on a five year schedule at 20% per year. So if you pull out of that project within that timeline, you have the probability of having that tax credit charged back. Now that's not a bad thing. In this position, holding an asset as a tax equity investor, there's obviously many benefits as we've already referenced in the PPA, the SSA, et cetera. And so just keep that in mind is when you're looking at making solar investments, understand that time value of money. So that way you can go in and say, do you know what, what type of investor am I and what category do I fit in? Um, not only from the fact of the tax appetite category of also the commitment value of time of money in that regard. Which financing is appropriate? So we talk a lot about different financing projects. We reference, you know, these would be good for this, that'll be good for that. Uh, there's no one size fits all, but the number one thing that we want you to learn is where the largest probability that they will find success in financing to take them to first. Could be a PPA, could be PACE. Uh, let, let's go there uh, first for probability purposes. Uh, the mush market, under 100 kilowatts, very tough to fund. We, we do that, so don't hesitate to send us a project to see if we can fund it, because again, a lot of them or the right timing of tax equity really shines and, and we can do that. Uh, For-profit, personal guarantees, all of that stuff you want to talk about on the front end, which we had mentioned. And look at this. So we put together a little structure for you. Uh, it's a spider's web, like we said, but Key takeaways, above the line, the tax credit goes to the customer. Below the line, the tax credit goes to a third party. So nonprofit, bottom, for-profit, top. Generally speaking, it's, it's not a perfect science, but 
you we want to take each customer to the appropriate financing. So cash purchase, bank loan, PACE loan, capital lease, operating or true lease, CREB bonds, which we didn't talk about, they're sometimes available. Uh, they're clean renewable energy bonds is what they stand for. And they're basically a 30 year loan at 1%, which is awesome for municipal. They're typically reserved for state municipalities uh, or public schools, anything that state money comes to and certain states offer this at certain times. So it's not available all the time, but it's a really good opportunity. So your PPA, SSA is prepaid, PACE PPA, and then your combos prepaid with PACE or prepaid with loans. So let's let this soak in for a second and this will all be available too. So it's gonna go to you and you can play around with this. Let's talk a little bit about grants. Grants always help projects. So there's certain grants available and for the past five years, there's been a Department of Energy tribal grant. So if you have access or relationship with any tribe anywhere across the country, uh, Alaska natives, whatever, if it's on a tribal reservation, they are eligible for a 50% tribal grant. That's five zero percent. We've been successful three out of three times with writing the grant and getting it approved. And we are going in with two more grants. So this is an opportunity to make a project wildly successful because 50% comes from the feds. Absolutely. So you Go ahead, Everett. And, and if you want to, just in the case to preface this really quick, um, you know, uh, again, kind of a pitch aspect, but in this regard, there is a grant available today. It has a very, very tight timeline. Um, to where submissions have to be in by July 1st. So that's obviously right around the corner. So in the case that you have any tribal entities you have relationships with that want to have the potential of qualifying for that 50% grant for these opportunities, please reach out to us immediately because that is a very short window. And we've seen the, the, the Department of Energy tribal grants change significantly over the years. So definitely take advantage of that this year and get a project across that finish line. Um, so just keep that in mind in the case there is something available July 1st of the deadlines. There is a lot of work to do prior to July 1st. So please reach out to us immediately and we can help uh, push that success of that project. The USDA REAP grant, uh, rural energy, something, something. I don't remember. What, there's too many acronyms in this business and you guys know that. So the USDA offers a 25% grant under 200,000 is one category above 200,000 is another category. And there's no, they typically cut off the applications in, uh, I believe it's September and March. So upcoming in September, you can apply for USDA grant. The basic requirement has to be in a city or town, a jurisdiction of 50,000 population or less. This, you know, we recently discovered a project that we were working on in South Lake Tahoe, South Lake Tahoe, population 22,000. Guess what? It, it, it's eligible. So we're going to go in for a REAP grant to help help that commercial solar project. Uh, CREB bonds we did talk about, not always available, but awesome for municipalities and local governments. And then miscellaneous state grants. Everett, do you want to chat about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So some states have some local grants that are available. Um, some common ones are as they'll typically come from a utility, a nonprofit, a uh, state funded entity in that regard in regards to renewable energy. Um, a common place for that is because a lot of times there's carbon credits on the back of those projects. So they need to hit a certain requirement for carbon reductions or CO2 emissions, greenhouse gases in that position. So in that regard, uh, they come and go many, many a time. So please just reach out, keep in touch. Um, there's multiple different systems and tools that are out there, like an energy tool base. A lot of times they keep those up to date, but don't be afraid to research at the utility level um, on their websites for any additional grants. A lot of times they're listed in those areas. Um, also keep included um, for any kind of energy storage grants that are available. So right now there's actually a incentive in addition in markets like SRP in Arizona for energy storage. Um, that was actually issued as a grant as a total combined solution where there's only a certain pot of money um, in that category. So definitely keep your eye on, the, uh, you know, finger on the pulse in that position because they change every day and those categories get filled up right away. 
in Northern California for the high wildfire area categories, people that were looking for energy storage that had uh, over a certain amount of power outages in a certain period of time due to high winds or fire concerns. Um, there was a grant available for, um, for energy storage. That energy storage capacity was filled up in four and a half weeks. So it can, be, it can come and go really quickly. We've used uh, uh, grant management associates. I, I'm not sure somebody responded with Atlas Consulting. All, all good places to go. We are not grant writers. However, banks hire us to do the feasibility study. So that's another part of our business. It's, it's more on the consulting side. So USDA comes to us and we write a lot of the feasibility studies just to, it's basically seeing if the project has legs and the, and the contractor hasn't botched the proposal. But uh, qualified consultants to write the grant, there's been costs as low as $2,500 and there's been costs as high as $30,000 depending on the grant. Uh, one tribe we work with, they were going for a 2.3 megawatt project for the DOE grant last year. They were awarded, but their cost to the grant writers were $30,000. So if you're talking a small USDA REAP grant, you, you may be looking at $2,500 to $5,000, which is included in, the, in your project cost. But that's why you have to have a customer that says, I'm doing this regardless of getting the grant, because you don't want to be stuck in, that, in the limbo of saying, I'll do it contingent upon getting the grant, because it's like the chicken and egg, who, who puts in the money and who pays for that. Uh, oftentimes, we'll go to the customer and say, look, for a rural grant or a small grant, you know, it'd be 2,500 bucks or it'd be $5,000, for example. If you don't get it, you pay me $2,500. And that's something you could maybe be able to work out with the consulting company that they get a higher fee upon success than if they don't. Because the last thing you want to do is pay some guy to write a grant and have him fail on you. So we can help uh, direct traffic there, but we don't physically write grants. Another thing we don't do just for everyone's knowledge is write RFPs for you. I can look at an RFP at a glance and tell you if it was written for someone specific or if it's really a fair shot to everybody that they just want bids and so i can kind of navigate the waters there but we don't write grants we will provide templates for somebody that wants to apply for an rfp with wathub because we have such a big statement of qualifications on projects that we've done so we can help bolster your response but we lean on our partners to write the write the rfps just want to make sure all right credit underwriting we're going to try to speed this up. You guys don't need to know this, but you do need to know AAA to BAA3. That's where you live. Anything under that non-investment grade speculative is junk. It's considered junk bonds typically. And very few nonprofits fall into the junk category. The more so we see in the BAA3, BAA2, which is investment grade. Your AAA is the US government. Your A1, A2, A3 are usually cities and counties, public schools, and your BAA1, BAA2, BAA3 are usually nonprofits uh, that we've seen and underwritten. So Moody's is the standard in terms of investment grade, non-investment grade. You want to request financials up front, and those required financials are listed below. And that's the minimum to get started. There may be some more requests based on what their financials say. But three years audited financial statements, two years balance sheet, and if they're drowning in debt, we would need a debt schedule. But generally speaking, that'll get us to an indicative pricing for you. Absolutely. And some businesses are not going to have an audited financial, so keep that in mind. So when you're looking for those, that information, that's where the Moody's and the S&P um, calculations come into play is you can actually kick out uh, a more granular detailed report especially the, uh, based off the inputs of a standard P&L and financial statement. Um, so you are going to run into small businesses that are not third-party audited. Again, jumping into financial statements, when you see them, most people don't look at them and they send them over to us. And unfortunately, I have to say that I can read a financial statement, but I'm not a CPA. I just have seen enough of them to navigate my way around knowing if they're worth a damn. The basic things you want to look at is you, you get a financial a statement of financial position, like, like what's on the screen, for example, does the company make money? 
if it's a for-profit company, you're going to want two out of the last three years to be profitable. If they're not profitable, you need to ask why. Did they make a big capital improvement? You know, did they, what did they do? Why weren't they profitable? Did their revenue get hit for COVID? Stuff like that. It's, you want the color to tell the bankers or lenders that look at things in black and white. You need those answers. So are they drowning in debt? Another common request that we get is we will see, let's use an HOA, for example, nonprofit HOA. They want to do a million dollar solar project. They have $250,000 in total assets in their, their life existence of the HOA. They have 250000 on the balance sheet. A lot of people are going to look at that and say, why would I give you a loan for a million dollars when you're really only worth 250000 total, not including liabilities? So that's a red flag that you want to take a look at. And then nonprofits heavily weighted on the balance sheet. Churches, for instance, they typically are good stewards of money. They typically have a lot of equity in their building, and they've, they've been around a long time. So they're good financial investments. Uh, for the most part, if they're sizable enough, but they're not supposed to make money. So if you look at a financial statement on a nonprofit and they don't make money, that's okay. They're not supposed to, but you want to see the trends in the financial statement. Are their tithes going down? Are their offerings going down? Are their membership going down? The financial statement will tell you all you need to know about the company and how it's run by looking at that. You don't need to know that. We do. So that's why we're good partners together. Getting into contracts. So contract fundability, we touched on it earlier. This is meaning a, EP, a, a PPA or an operating lease or some sort of contract that you're gonna have with a customer for financing. You wanna use open source documents. Uh, you don't wanna delete entire sections and so that'll exclude it from fundability. Uh, don't sell on buyout in year six. A lot of people try to play with that and sell that. That's a common mistake is they'll put a PPA together and they'll say, yeah, but you, you could buy it out in year six and look at how low the fair market value buyout is. Well, that's not fundable because that, that screws up the return for the long-term owner and they won't take that contract. So just be careful of that and we can help you guide the waters and what net present value of future cash flow for the investor is good, which six and a half or seven is, is in the ballpark. And then production guarantees, we offer production guarantees, so there's, there's no right or wrong answer here, but a production guarantee doesn't help your case in selling a PPA that you got signed to a financial entity. Uh, that's just another risk on them. And if you didn't have a production guarantee, obviously it's sexier because there's no, uh, no, there's no hook there. But we know and we require all of our EPCs to pass our process, our QAQC, we stay on them. We have internal project managers to whip their ass when they're not communicating with us and make sure that we get pictures and updates weekly uh, as low as daily on, on some high profile projects. So we're going to, we've been through this project, uh, this process a thousand times, and we're going to be right next to you to help make sure that your contract is fundable. Talking about an EPC contract, you need a vetted EPC. If you're doing a project that's large scale, let's say it's a million dollars, let's say it's that's bigger. The EPC is going to need to have some financial clout to do it. And that's what the financing company is going to require. They're not going to take any old company that just wants to do it. They're not going to approve you as an EPC if you have the project because you may not just be big enough or you might not have enough experience in commercial. Everybody's got to start somewhere. We started from nothing and we grew and we can help you. Um, you know, there could be a situation where we bring in a paper GC where you get to do the work, but you're overseed by the paper GC. It's a lot bigger that meets the requirements. Uh, Milestone-based contracts. This is typical in all EPC agreements from third-party financing companies. They're not going to pay you more than you need to do the project. And oftentimes they pay you less. They need to know that you're going to carry a little bit of the project. Uh, so that's why an EPC with some financial clout is needed. Uh, termination for convenience. This is in most contracts. The financing company can say, I don't like what you're doing. Get the hell out. They have to pay you up into that point, but that it's in. So just make sure you, you do your job or make sure the EPC does their job and is communicating. Lots of documentation and pictures required. That's typical. 
last but not least is additional documents that if you're bringing a PPA in and you're running customer facing on the project, you may be required to go get an SNDA, which is a non-disturbance agreement. It basically says the solar system on your property, if you get foreclosed on, the bank takes your building that is not included. So it's a document that essentially says it's not a fixture, it's personal property, it's ours, you can't touch it. Uh, an easement documentation, most PPAs, have easement documentation in the PPA. So a separate one may not be needed, but depending on the, EP, uh, the PPA contract you're using, uh, we could take a look at that. Title documents, survey phase ones required on a lot of projects. Uh, and then get ready to read a contract to understand it. Don't read it just to sign it and get the deal. There's little clauses in there. And something that comes to mind as an example is COVID. We've seen back and forth lawyer interpretations on is COVID an act of God that gets somebody out of their lease payment? Let's say they're a restaurant and they lease space from a landlord. Is little things like that. that we're looking back at our leases and we're saying, oh, we signed this, but we blew over the acts of God and the pandemic and things like that. These are things that unfortunately lawyers do for us and they cost a lot of money. But that's why we pay them to cover our ass and make sure that if something happens that's out of the ordinary, you are covered. You get extensions of time. You get additional change orders that are deemed approved, stuff like that that's unforeseen. Absolutely. And, and just to, you know, um, to get into sales confidence here, you know, one thing that, that uh, you know, make sure you, you please ask yourself is, is that, you know, what am I a solar developer? I think that's a common misinterpretation in our industry. And to make sure you have that confidence, just, just don't be afraid to just own your spot and own your position of what you have as your expertise, your scope of work and roles and responsibilities. And a good commercial company um, overall is a collaboration of a lot of great companies um, from start to finish. You know, nobody goes and typically builds a house from, from start to finish. Nobody's pulling wires. The same guy that's doing the finish work at your home. That's also mounting the sink, um, you know, in the restroom. So don't be afraid to call on us in, in those regards, but a, a true developer is someone that has and owns the legal documents, the contracts, the SNDAs, um, your sign and assumptions agreements, your underwriting uh, requirements and, and qualifying for that making sure that you are asking the right questions in regards to um, setting expectations to that EPC agreement and setting up those standards. Someone that can run the milestone management of those processes and making sure that you have the uh, mindset and understanding of what to look at from your progress photos and your uh, contractor details and your daily logs. That is a true definition of a developer. Um, uh, commonly, we see a lot of people that are on the sales acquisition side that state as a developer, and, so, and that's where those further pieces are missing. And of course, in the case that that is, that is needed to bridge that gap and support that, you know, WattHub and many other partners out there are great solutions for that. Just make sure you're vetting them properly and ask the right questions. So to gain confidence in this industry, really just look at the position you sit in and then surround yourself with the proper uh, partners to fulfill that project where uh, you can't put yourself in hot water, especially if you're on the sales acquisition side, making sure that you have the confidence now going through 101, 201, and 301 now with us, that you have the proper armor, the responses, the uh, setting the proper expectations, of how the timeline of that product is going to go and some of the information you're, just going to, you're going to need from the client. That way the end result ends up being a successful installation without any challenges along the way. Nothing's worse than going out and setting an expectation and all of a sudden the product falls on its face and it's your integrity that's on the line. Um, nothing's worse than having those expectations set where you have a partner where uh, the due diligence was not put in play or sometimes there's just kind of a smoke and mirrors approach and all of a sudden you get in hot water halfway through and then your integrity gets, gets pulled through the mud. So um, keep that in mind when you're looking at these opportunities and, you know, uh, you know, let the pride settle. 
Everybody's here to take care of it. The piece of pies are very these categories. Um, there's a lot of work to be go around. There's very few businesses overall that have solar on them. If you look at it from a residential to the business ratio and uh, keep that in mind that those opportunities are great, but they do have to be tended to properly. Great point. Brings us into knowledge is power. The number one takeaway I want you to all learn from this is know your customer financially speaking. We get a lot of projects sent to us and say, look at this project, it's one megawatt. Customer has great credit. Not necessarily true. We ask the question, well, do you see their financials? Or and if you have them, send them to us. They're like, oh, I haven't seen them. Well, how, how do you know that the customer has great credit if you have never seen them, their financials? You, you don't. And so the only way to know that is requesting financials. So finding out how they're going to pay for it. If they say, well, I would like to look at financing options, great, we'll provide them for you. At least you know what, and then the next conversation is, do you have the tax appetite? Do you not have the tax appetite? Navigating the waters, leading them to the highest probability of finance, and then getting to know them financially. Uh, you know a customer is serious when they seek their own loan. If they are really a champion of the project and said, I want to do this, I'm going to go to my bank and ask them for the money, you know there's a high probability of getting that deal because if it pencils economically on the project and savings and he, he or she is going to get their own money, wonderful. You can help provide them options and we can help provide those to you too, but that's, that's a deal you want to be working on. It's worth your time. Uh, cost dictates rate. When you know the avoided cost, again, back to 101, commercial solar 101, get their interval data, get their bills, get rid of demand charges, know where they stand. From there, we, we've seen a bunch of projects that said, hey, I want financing for this project and my cost is this. I can look at their avoided costs and say, well, your cost is gonna have to be that, which is different, and it may not be what they wanna hear, but it is true that there's no deal because your cost is too high that puts any amount of financing, even at a low interest rate, uh, higher than their savings. What to do when the funding is a solid maybe. So this is the gray area projects. These are the portfolios, these are the small projects. A lot of them just take some time. So setting that expectation if it falls into a gray area where could be funded, could not be funded, let's say it's 101 kilowatts, where could be third party owned, could be denied. Um, set that proper expectations of time that, hey, your, your project's small, even if you think 100 kilowatts is big, got to tell the customer your project is small. This may take some time to fund, but when it does, we will achieve the great the long-term savings for you. And then Wadhub can manage project finance for you. Well, appreciate it. We're gonna we're gonna cut it off now. We want to help you guys. We want to help everyone make money, and we're gonna do it together because it does take a village. So appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you, John and Everett, for taking time out of your day to present all of this great information. Uh, we are pleased to be working with Watt Hub on some of our future commercial solar deals and appreciate everyone being on the call today and hope that you found value in today's information. If you're watching this on the replay, be sure to hit that like, comment, and subscribe and smash that bell for future updates. So until next time, have fun storming the castle. Bye now.